time and uh, did not have an active sediment on previous year analysis. Um, and uh, I don't know why I said urinating normally, oozing continent, uh, but certainly eating, eating, drinking, and defecating normally. Um, he had no evidence of abdominal pain on his physical exam, uh, no discomfort when I palpated his back or neurologic abnormalities on exam, except for the fact that his bladder felt like it had tone, but I could express him fairly readily. And then um, despite all of our uh, attempts to find anything uh, with his external urethra, um, he did not have a penis, uh, which sort of made sense because he'd been spayed previously, so it's intersex cat. Um, on our diagnostics, there was nothing on his renal panel or urinalysis, um, and on abdominal ultrasound, there was no significant uh, abnormalities. Um, we started uh, phenylpropanolamine um, at one and a half milligrams per kilogram TID and had the owners uh, clean his perineum daily. And they noticed that um, when he was wandering around, his continence was significantly improved, but um, still present when he was sleeping or at rest. Uh, he just came in yesterday, actually two days ago, for um, follow-up, and we offered a uh, neuro exam and CT pyelography, and I chatted with the surgeons about potentially doing a hydraulic occluder for him, um, and the owners uh, informed me that uh, what I was offering them was a quarter of their annual salary, so they declined. Um, they did allow a neuro exam, though, uh, which was otherwise normal, and then elected to continue with PPA. So, you know, not the most satisfying of stories, but um, at any rate, I don't see incontinent cats that often, so it was of interest to me. Uh, and for whatever reason, Orlando seems to be a hotbed of seeing in, uh, intersex animals. Uh, we've had quite a uh, number of cases. It'd be interesting to find out from you folks at some point how many intersex patients are coming to see you. Um, can I take this opportunity to just ask, can everybody hear me reasonably well? Yes, very well. Yes. Okay, Okay. Good. good. Thank you. All right, so, um, and is the, um, is the dialogue panel for go to training taking up the right side of my screen, or can you see the entire screen? Entire screen. Okay, good. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, uh, feline incontinence was actually a focus of early research in physiology in the 1950s. Um, and trying to figure out the uh, reflexes of micturition in the cat um, took up quite a few papers during that time. And, and actually, from my understanding, and people are welcome to disagree, um, this is sort of information that helped inform the development of um, uh, cystometrograms and uh, uh, urethral pressure profiles. And that was of some interest to me. I will say that um, this research is a little bit tough to read from an IACUC standpoint, but um, it did help us to understand uh, the setup of nerves within the pelvis and also what the uh, nerve activity looks like uh, when uh, different parts of uh, micturation, the storage phase and the voiding phase are going on. Um, I did start to put together a history slide uh, for you folks of prior research, although I realized that a lot of this is summarized uh, within the paper. And I just I wanted to focus a little bit more on polling from ASVNU. So um, I sent out this survey beforehand, and thank you folks for responding. I just wanted to get an idea of how much feline incontinence people were seeing uh, in their practice. And it seems like most people's experience from the 18 respondents that we had is similar to my own. So around zero to five cases a year. And I, I would say I probably see um, somewhere in the order of two or three incontinent cats a year that aren't uh, FIC cases. I would love to know um, which clinic is seeing 10 to 20 cases a year. 
um, because I think that would be really interesting to see the variety of cases that are, are coming in to, to see you. I suspect that was a university clinic, but I could be wrong. So in looking at this paper, um, the study objective was to get a better understanding of underlying causes, treatments, and outcomes uh, with feline incontinence. And it was a retrospective observational study. And uh, shoot, hang on, sorry. Um, and I'm always interested in looking at uh, the key points from the introduction. So uh, urinary incontinence was uh, previously 4% of urinary cases in one 17-year study of cat data. Another study had only four of a significant number of geriatric cats that had urinary incontinence. And uh, it's asso been associated previously with spinal cord, urinary bladder, urethra, or uh, reproductive um, areas. And in one study of 19 cats, there were nine with congenital USMI. You'll see later that there are quite a few USMI cases um, out there in ASVNU. Um, and then in another study, nine out of uh, the nine cats with urinary retention were FELD positive. Um, whether or not the FELD was the actual cause of urinary incontinence is another question. And if anybody uh, wants to say anything at any point during this presentation, feel, please feel free to talk. I have a few prompts in here. Okay, so um, looking at the uh, PCOT for this study, um, the population and time frame, I just usually like to conflate in the same category. So um, these are cats uh, presenting for urinary incontinence to one veterinary hospital over an 11 year period um, with involuntary uh, urination and they had 45 different search terms. It's an uh, retrospective study uh, for the intervention. The data analysis was looking for favorable outcome uh, if urinary incontinence improved with therapy. I looked through all of the different uh, stats and thought that they all seemed appropriate for uh, the data being evaluated. Uh, risk factors were age of onset, anatomic site, uh, the micturation phase, so voiding or storage, um, whether or not the patient had neurologic signs, uh, present of an under, presence of an underlying UTI, and uh, the ultimate treatment. And after the first data analysis, the anatomic site was the only important site. Um, so going through and doing the second data analysis, they were looking for uh, which anatomic site uh, was most important for those patients. Um, and for a comparator, I just put down prior studies because that seems to be what the uh, comparator was. This was not a study looking at, um, you know, case match controls or um, comparing to other potential interventions. So uh, looking at the outcome um, in the population, there were 45 cats um, total. So this was out of a much larger uh, population, but 45 cats that were incontinent uh, with a median age of 54 months and uh, bimodal peak distribution. 91% uh, of the cats was, were mixed breed, um, which is not surprising. I don't think we get many purebred cats um, in the different institutions that I've been in previously. Uh, the population was biased towards spinal disorders, um, and it's an interesting point that I'll kind of bring up later on for our ASVNU um, respondents. Uh, urethral disease was more common in male cats, uh, which is not tremendously surprising. Um, bladder disorders were more common in older cats. 53% uh, of cats had voiding disorders, and 40%, 7% had storage disorders, so pretty even split. Um, and then there were one or more uh, neurologic signs uh, noted in 36% of cats. 40% um, had a spinal cord site affected and 38% had bladder sites affected. Um, and then congenital disorders were a relatively low percentage of the cases. Uh, and there was no difference noted for functional problems for breed, body weight, duration of clinical signs, blood work, urinalysis, or urine culture. Um, this is table two on the right-hand side with uh, demographic features noted for uh, voiding versus storage disorders. And um, I think, you know, one thing that's of interest is just that uh, the creatinine and 
uh, media and USG were fairly comparable. So looking at um, our ASVNU survey responses to sort of see what um, percentage of cases we're seeing for uh, different anatomic sites and also storage phase versus voiding phase. Um, for the storage phase, it looks like the majority of respondents, so five people, um, saw uh, one to 25% of the cases coming in the door uh, that were storage phase. Um, and then actually a fair number of respondents did not see any. Um, for the voiding phase, it seems like uh, quite a number of people see in the one to 50% range of cases coming in for voiding phase related incontinence. Uh, and then we have quite a number of respondents who, uh, so four um, who didn't see any patients coming in for voiding phase cases. Um, looking at spinal disorders, um, the majority of the respondents, so nine out of, uh, looks like about 15 uh, people responded that uh, they were seeing in the uh, one to 50% range for spinal disorders. Um, far more people were finding bladder dis disorders to be a little bit um, uh, less common, so one to 25% of uh, people, so six respondents were seeing bladder disorders. Um, and then a pretty even split for the number of urethral disorders coming in the door um, for incontinence. So looking at uh, causes of incontinence from the uh, paper, uh, you'll see the uh, table on the left-hand side with voiding phase disorders. So fair number of those patients were uh, spinal cord related cases. About half of them were uh, uh, the rest of the cases, uh, sorry, excuse me. Seven, seven of those cases were urethral related and a surprising, uh, in my mind, a surprising number of um, cases for FIC, so relatively low, uh, decent number of urethral strictures in that group. For storage phase disorders, um, the majority of them were urethra related. Um, looking at our ASVNU survey responses, uh, there were 10 uh, people who responded about uh, voiding phase disorders that they had seen, with the majority being related to detrusor atony or overflow incontinence. And then for storage phase disorders, there were 11 uh, reported storage phase disorders, with three of those being uh, USMI related, um, which I found interesting, actually a relatively low number of spinal related neurologic reports, um, and only one ectopic ureter reported in that whole group. And again, if anybody wants to jump in and make any comments about their personal experiences, um, we did have 18 respondents, which I think is great, but I know that there are a lot more of you than that. So if you have any input, I'd definitely be interested. Um, I was just wondering, because I, th I think John is on the, the rounds too, and I don't know if he can comment um, if, because I, I, to be honest, I don't see a lot of feline micturition disorders in practice, you know, maybe one a year, maybe. Um, I don't get a lot, but I was wondering if, if John thought, you know, if his reputation and um, their, the, I guess the university's reputation, if that might have caused maybe more of those cases to get sent over, or or why they might have had just as many cases as they did, or maybe I'm just missing them all um, because I just don't see it that commonly. And I I know Julie's on too, so I'd love to hear other people's experiences. It seemed like many people only saw a couple cases, but I'd love to potentially see more of these. Um, but any idea why, you know, why Kruger was collecting all these cases over the this time period um, and if he can share his tips for the rest of us. Yeah, I would love to hear that too. I was wondering if Dr. Kruger's reputation might be one of the reasons that all the cases seem to be uh, accumulating there. Um, because I, 
yeah, I, I just tend not to see a lot of cats with incontinence, and um, especially with the degree of uh, case variability that was reported here. So that's an interesting thing. So um, this is Julie. Um, I feel like we have, I feel like I've seen more just in the last 12 months, even like we've had like four or five cases and um, two of them from one particular referral place. But um, it always seemed to me in the past that, and I don't usually see the neurologic ones. I think a lot of the neurologic ones might self identify or refer into our neuroservice. And so that would be an interesting thing. I never actually asked our neurologists how often they see it, but I don't feel like I see a lot of the neuro cases. I see, I feel like the ones that I'm end up seeing are congenital malformations, like weird things like the horns of the uterus coming off the top of the bladder or some weird stuff like that, that ends up going surgery, going to surgery or uh, McLaughlin and I had a case that uh, a male cat that had topic ureters um, that she did surgically because uh, there was no way I was going to get anything in there to do a laser. Um, and it, it was very, uh, I don't know, my impression, I was actually one of the reviewers for the paper. Um, sorry, John, if I offended you with any of my comments, but um, I thought that um, it was really interesting to read it. And I thought that uh, it was interesting how many of them were neurologic. And I, I really have a strong suspicion I just don't see the neural ones because they go to our neuro service. I will speak on behalf of Dr. Kerger. If you look at the chat comments, um, he says his microphone is malfunctioning. Um, but um, he says there may be a center bias, but they do seem to show up. Um, I will say this was my residency project. Over the three years of my residency, we just seem to kind of accumulate them. And I think it kind of was once our neurology service, medicine service, ER service, everybody kind of knew about this and that Dr. Kruger does a very good job, I think, of educating everybody in the hospital about weird urinary things. Like once we kind of knew what to look for, these cats just kind of came out of the woodwork. Well, I think it's really cool research to be able to gather all this information in one place. Yeah, it was a, a big project, <laughs> but I'm glad we were able to get it all done. <laughs> Hi, this is Jody. I'd like to know a little bit more about the diagnosis, meaning that I have a hard time um, making sure that these cats actually had what you talked about in the sense that it sounds like most of them were owner um, owner information. I'd like to know how many actually had clinical signs that were consistent with what the owner was saying? That is a really good question. And I do think that was one of the um, struggles we had doing a retrospective study, which I think we did address to some extent in our discussion. Um, the workup for all of these cats was completely different across the board. So in some cases, unfortunately, we did have to kind of rely just on the owners um, describing the incontinence and in those cases we usually included the cats if we had like multiple like follow-ups and you know really really good evidence that these owners actually knew what they were looking at and that the cats actually did have incontinence um the ones where it was found on physical exam that was obviously a little bit easier um but a lot of these cases did come through our er service and so there was no consistent workup for a lot of these cases unfortunately I guess I'm confused because the paper doesn't say what you actually used to make your diagnosis when you did additional evaluation. Um, I believe we kind of addressed that in terms of we considered um, urinary incontinence basically the presence of passively leaked urine either noted by the owner or noted on the physical exam by the attending clinician. I don't know if that completely answered your question. No, because I just don't know. I mean, if, if um, I, I guess I wish I knew like how many actually were made on the diagnosis of the physical exam and how many were diagnosed by the owner and what clinical signs did you actually use to say that they were truly leaking? 
So I don't know if you used um, staining of the fur or something else. Um, so that's why I was just a little bit confused in terms of, so if I wanted to repeat this study to verify what you said, it would be impossible for me to repeat based on the information that was provided in the materials and methods. So we have um, in our methods that cats were included if they had a diagnosis based on owner observations of involuntary urine leakage or if we observe them ourselves on their exam leaking urine and that was our inclusion criteria. Okay, I also have the other question about why you guys decided to put them in a group avoiding disorders and storage disorders when the method of, your, of you making that diagnosis to me seems very unreliable, meaning for me to, to make that diagnosis of a small bladder and a big bladder, and there was no indication of what you actually called a small bladder or a big bladder. So again, I can never repeat this study. But then the question becomes, to me, bladder size only matters when you actually see the disease going on in order to make that assessment. I would say that, uh, and again, I think Dr. Kruger might chime on in this a little bit too, because what we primarily did was we tried to get them included on the basis of either their clinical signs or their exam findings. And then from that starting point, we classified them based on bladder size along with other things into voiding and storage groups. So I'm, I'm not sure if that completely answered your question, but what we primarily tried to do was define, okay, is this cat truly incontinent? And okay, if it is incontinent, is it a storage phase or is it avoiding phase disorder? Yeah, the only, only reason why I say that is because when I look at incontinent dogs who are female dogs who have urethrosphincter mechanism incompetence, depending upon when I evaluate them, their bladder can be big, can be small, can be medium sized. And in terms of the methods and materials, there was no indication of what you called a small bladder or a large bladder. So I could never, how, how can I say, I could never evaluate whether or not that was there. So I was just curious why you put that as a, in the micturation phase when, to me, palpating the bladder of those other things seem unreliable and either just put it as a specific disorder because it may be misleading if, um, if I'm trying to categorize them based on those phases, based on the methods in which that um, category was actually, in which the cats were divided into that category. Yeah, and I agree with you that that is very fuzzy and that was something that we struggled with a little bit. Um, and I think as, as much as we possibly could, we did try to address the fact that unfortunately it was a retrospective study. We had zero definitive parameters. You know, if the bladder is less than this many centimeters, it's considered a small bladder or a large bladder. Um, what we tried to do was look at many different things all together. So if the physical exam finding was that the bladder was small, um, were there radiographs? Were there ultrasound findings? Was there something else that we could use to kind of better classify that, that cat? Um, but that was one of the limitations was just that um, as best we could, we tried to get these cats into groupings that were helpful groupings in terms of, you know, outcomes and comorbidities and things like that. Um, but it wasn't always crystal clear. And I think one of the things that we really ears illustrated with our paper, and I, I think most of us have seen this clinically too, is that these cats predominantly across the board, like do not read the book. I think it's hard to classify things in disorders of voiding or disorders of storage um, from a physical exam, unless the animal, and because this is how I do it when I've got, you know, dogs with DUD and that sort of thing, unless they've just urinated, actively urinated, intentionally urinated, and then palpate their bladder and say, okay, is the bladder big or small? And oftentimes I end up, because, you know, they never want to pee in the hospital, I'll have the <laughs> owners actually watch them at home if they catch them right after they visited the litter box to just feel the belly and feel if they feel what feels like a bag, a balloon or whatever, I may try and teach them how to palpate a bladder just so they can get an idea. Because in dogs, at least that's how I usually try and do my characterization of disorders of storage or um, voiding is 
obviously watching them urinate, which again, will never happen with cats and based on that one study where people don't even know how often their cats go to the litter box for real. Um, Quimby can attest to that. Um, but that we really, it's so hard to assess that because you know you want to look at residual volumes and things like that and cats we just it's very challenging to be able to do that yeah so that's why i was saying that maybe that should not have been a part of the paper because it can be misleading especially the way the diagnosis was made so they made it they made an interpretation instead of using an observation to make table one up so that was my only concern is that it may be very misleading the way those cats were grouped Okay. Oh, sorry. Let's see what Dr. Kruger's comment is. Thank you for responding also, Dr. Kruger. Does anyone else have any comments? Um, I still want to know for the future, what's a small bladder and what's a big bladder? And did anyone actually provide any measurements um, so that if I were looking at my cat, since that's how you made that distinction, um, what would be used? So, Dr. Lilich, do you routinely ultrasound patients before and after voiding to try to get an idea of residual volume? Um, yeah, there are many ways to get an idea of residual volume. I guess what I was looking at so for me, if I'm going to assess bladder size, you're right, it would, I would have to actually see clinical disease going on. So what I'm just curious is because they mentioned a small bladder and a big bladder, but there's no way for me to assess what that is from this paper. Maybe the authors can provide insight in what they actually used. And if they hey. can, it's not a problem. Oh, I'm, I'm here. Sorry. I was waiting for Kruger to chip in, but I think he's having some technical difficulties. So I will I will kind of speak to that. Um, so a lot of it was just kind of subjective based on what we had available for each cat. For pretty much every cat in the study, we had at least a physical exam and or some sort of imaging. Um, so we used a combination of those things. And I do agree that in a perfect world, we would have been able to, again, like measure the bladder on ultrasound before or after voiding. Um, but that was not practical and, and we mostly did not have that data retrospectively. So what we started with was the physical exam findings for the cat. Um, and if the bladder size was noted in those physical exam findings, then that was kind of what we relied on. Um, if there was a question, um, we went to imaging, we went to, you know, whatever else data we had on any of these cases. Um, some of them, we were, you know, we had tons of information. We had CT scans, we had scopes, we had everything, but some of them we did not have a lot. So in most cases, we relied primarily on the physical exam findings of the individual clinician palpating the bladder and, and subjectively saying, okay, I feel like this is a small bladder. Okay, I feel like this is a large bladder. And we really did just try to do that basically to sort of organize these cases in such a way that we could start to, like Dr. Kruger said, look for some outcomes, look for some therapeutic approaches, just to kind of get these cases um, in a way that we could get some more information from them. And then part of the reason why we did it two ways, we did it based on anatomic location and based on voiding versus storage was because we did kind of want to compare and contrast. If we grouped these cats, these 45 cats in different ways, would we get different outcomes? Okay, uh, but I'm assuming you didn't get different outcomes really. So that's what was interesting. 
We really didn't, no. You're right. Yeah, so, so that's why I was wondering why would we group them that way in retrospect looking at your study. But it's, it's okay, I understand. Um, it was subjective, so I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and press on if everyone's okay with that. Um, all right, hang on. So uh, moving on to the outcome. Um, so for treatment and resolution, the voiding phase disorders were most commonly administered um, antibiotics, opioids, and anxiolytics. Um, storage phase disorder patients most commonly were given antibiotics, opioids, and PPA, uh, which makes sense. Uh, bacterial UTIs were actually noted in a relatively low number of cats, so less than half of them on urine culture, and um, less than half of cats treated with antibiotics had a urinary tract infection. Um, 19 out of 38 cases with outcome data improved, um, with 16 of those cases becoming uh, continent. And um, as we've been talking about, there's a, a prevalence of spinal cord lesions in this paper, and these were 2.67 times more likely to have a negative outcome, um, with the majority of those being from either spinal trauma or congenital spinal malformations. So sorry, um, this got a little bit fuzzy when I made it larger. So this is the paper, uh, the table with demographic features and clinical pathologic findings and clinical outcomes. I found it interesting um, that there were only uh, two out of nine patients uh, with spinal cord disorders that had a positive urine culture. Um, so certainly that is not the bias that um, I would expect from uh, canine cases. Um, I also found it interesting that there was such a low number of uh, bladder-related incontinence cases, and I suspect it's just because of the relatively few number of uh, cats in that group with a urine culture um, that was positive. Um, also, there were uh, very few, few ureter cases um, involved in this uh, paper as well, and I, I realize that there are relatively few um, ectopic ureters in cats, but certainly there's a lot of ureteral disorders with them, and so I, I sort of found it interesting that there were relatively few um, patients represented. Um, but again, we don't see a lot of cats with incontinence full stop, and it's nice to see um, a large number of cats reported as it is. So uh, moving along to the discussion section for um, voiding versus uh, storage disorders, voiding phase disorders were more common in male cats, uh, which I guess I didn't find particularly surprising. Um, and again, I didn't find storage phase disorders being more common in female cats uh, particularly surprising. Um, the voiding phase patients tended to be younger than the storage phase disorders. Uh, and voiding phage patients had additional neuro disorders uh, than the storage phage, phase patients that were examined. So with urethral disease, um, there was a decent likelihood of improvement, so 69% uh, of those cases improved. Uh, there's a relatively broad number of causes that have been previously reported. Um, the causes being more common in males um, and just noting that there were five patients with perineal urethrostomy that developed incontinence and two that were catheterized that subsequently were incontinent. Just think that that's important information when considering outcomes for our patients that are transferred over to uh, the surgery department. Uh, and then for spinal disorders, um, the majority of these had an unfavorable outcome. Um, half the patients in the study had spinal cord trauma I would say that's where the majority of my neurologic patients have come from with incontinence, um, and that's probably due to the, uh, at least according to the authors, the extent of the uh, spinal cord in cats. Um, previously, uh, temporary or permanent urinary incontinence was noted in 73% of cats in another study. Uh, and again, if anybody has comments on this part of the discussion, I'd be interested if people wanted to chime in. 
I just put in the chat if anybody remembers from the PU papers how many what percentage of like in PU cases develop urinary incontinence. I just don't, don't recall off the top of my head. But I can try to look it up as we're going on. Yeah, I mean the ones that I see, I feel like I've seen that developed incontinence were ones where there had to be a revision, um, you know, like the first one strictured or something, and then it had to be revised or something like that. And so you're getting a much shorter urethra and op opening up at a wider spot potentially. But those are just that's just off the top of my head that I recall. The PUs that I've seen with incontinence all had concurrent bacteria and likely had urethritis um, more more than the revisions, and those improved with antibiotic therapy. Um, but I'll see if I can pull that paper as we're going forward. Does anybody else have comments? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Oop, hang on. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Thank you for the comments in the chat section. Um, and you, and if you wouldn't mind, um, some people had emailed after the session uh, last time that they couldn't see the chat. So if you wouldn't oh, mind, oh sure, I can, I can, I can definitely read the comments. Uh, yeah, so maybe, no, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was feeling a little bit awkward about um, <laughs> commenting on those. So um, Dr. Adams says uh, regarding classification, looking at the specific diagnosis for cats in the voiding phase group. 15 had neurologic disorders that could result in persistent urine retention, and the seven classified as urethral disorders with FIC slash spasm, one patient, or strictures, six. These cats could easily have persistently over-distended urinary bladders. I agree some estimation of bladder size slash volume post-voiding would be ideal. And then Dr. Lovato addressing the PU issue says, I think that I have seen more with incontinence after revision surgeries. Um, Dr. Kruger says present prevalence seems to range from 1 out of 15, 3 out of 11, 6 out of 16. I believe that Dr. Kruger is referring to the previous papers on perineal urethrostomy. And I'll make sure to read the comments in the future. Um, so uh, Dr. Atley had made a, a um, Oh, sorry, Atie, Atie, uh, I, I apologize if I'm really doing your name incorrectly, uh, made a comment saying, regarding the question about what people are seeing in practice, when I was in private practice last year, I saw three cases that I recall, and two out of three had spinal cord disease, and the third was a PU complication resulting in stricture. We did not have a neurologist, so that could be a reason why there was that bias. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have any comments? I, I just pulled the 2020 paper on PUs, which was 74 cases, um, looking at outcome, and they didn't specifically mention urinary incontinence. They said that 11% uh, had uh, like persistent urinary problems after the PU, which included dysuria, hematuria, and urinating outside the litter box, but I don't know if that was like behavioral periuria, or if that potentially could have included incontinence, but they didn't break it down in that last paper, um, but it would be within that 11% of cats that would be there um, for that grouping, I would imagine. Thank you, JD. Okay, um, so moving on, um, for congenital abnormalities, 
Um, these were significantly less um, in cats than in dogs, most likely due to the fact that there are lower rates of ectopic ureters in this study and previous study. Um, patients with urinary bladder uh, site incontinence had a high likelihood of recovery. Um, six of these were inflammation-associated detrusor dysfunction. Um, one of the things that I found interesting in this study was incontinence associated with ureteral stent and subplacement. Um, as the authors note, certainly dysuria has been associated previously with um, the placement of those devices, uh, but the incontinence that I've seen previously was related to uh, UTI associated with those devices, not like a mechanical effect. Um, and uh, sorry, Dr. Kruger is asking how commonly are folks seeing FELV-related incontinence, and that's something that I think is going to be on the next slide or a little bit later. Um, we can't tell if cats with inflammatory diseases in this study had urge incontinence or not. Um, I would think that that might be something we could assess um, with urethral, urethral pressure profiling if we had a small enough catheter. Um, and then I there think were actually I think I think Jody Westrop may have looked at a group of FIC cats cats and done urodynamic studies on them. Oh, cool. Um, I can't remember if it was published as a paper, but I think she presented it as an abstract at one point um, that they did not see um, detrusor uh, instability with within their CMGs in those cases. I think anybody else remember this, or am I completely fantasizing about it? And I'm sorry, I said UPP when I meant to say CMG. <laughs> but I love the idea that that's what you're dreaming of, Julie. So, uh, and then um, I'll wait and see if there ends up being a response in the chat to let that last question. Um, but uh, the authors mentioned considering FIC for cats with urinary incontinence with co-occurring lower urinary tract signs. So uh, comorbid conditions, UTI was not associated with outcome, uh, which I thought was interesting. And I wondered if that was a sample size bias or if that's just generally true. Um, I, I guess I thought that was an, an interesting outcome from the study. So um, I usually like to highlight kind of the, the few interesting tidbits from the discussion from other papers. So there was just a comment about uh, feline urethral anatomy having more uh, longitudinal smooth muscle and a narrower lumen. Um, and therefore there's more resistance and uh, longitudinal shortening is required to open the uh, urethral sphincter, um, perhaps a reason why maybe there's less functional incontinence that might be seen in the feline urethra than in the uh, canine urethra. Um, and there was a past case control study showing uh, that urinary incontinence was a significant uh, risk factor for the development of UTI. So from this study, um, factors favoring UTI were really related to whether or not there's a soiled perineum and therefore an ascending UTI risk. So um, factors include uh, urine retention, so detrusor muscle areflexia or partial urethral obstruction, um, urine pooling, and storage phase disorders. Um, cats are that. Sorry, is somebody trying to make a comment? Okay, sorry, Dr. Adams is mentioning that um, he has not seen urinary incontinence related to FELV and took it off of his lecture slides as a cause after several years. Dr. Foster also said he hasn't seen one. So uh, cats with surgery had greater than 50% improvement, um, but there was not enough medical data for any particular therapy. Um, no cats in the study responded to PPA well. Uh, previously, there had been a response noted. Um, uh, oh, sorry, this was previously noted in three cats with congenital USMI and cats post PU, whereas other studies showed a favorable response. So, um, just looking at um, 
our uh, sampling from uh, ASV and U. So uh, five individuals had seen um, uh, feline dysautonomia as a cause of one to 25% of uh, cases coming in the door. Uh, and the reason that I asked about this is because the study said that they did not see any dysautonomia, bladder torsion, congenital anomalies, or FELV. Uh, most of the respondents had not seen an FELV incontinence case, but three had seen one to 25% of their cases coming in um, with FELV. Um, relatively few cases for congenital anomalies, and then for um, bladder torsion, um, basically there was one respondent, and I kind of wondered if that was the person who wrote the study on uh, the 2015 case report on bladder torsion. Um, and then Dr. Clouroux is saying that um, uh, also agreeing no FELV related incontinence there. Uh, Dr. Byron says, I had one FELV I phone consult consulted on, but did not see in the hospital. Does any other, anyone else have any experience with FELV? Is there a proposed pathophysiology? I'm just trying to wrap my head around how that might cause incontinence is it viral inclusions causing decreased cellular function or i guess i haven't looked into it because i haven't seen it um, it's a it's, it's thought it's thought to be a neuropathy as far as i was able to find i think there's like one paper that talks about it um the, it's a neuro paper and it, it's that feline leukemia can lead supposedly can lead to some neuropathies in the spinal cord or probably or possible peripheral neuropathies it wasn't really well documented but that's was my under so a lot of i i could be wrong but i think some of the feluke literature that talks about that was before we knew that fiv existed and so i've often wondered if some of these were actually fiv that they were seeing that an animal had both viruses and we just didn't know that fiv was a thing So Dr. Quimby said, I'd say it's more likely a link if they also have spinal lymphoma. Uh, Dr. Kruger says FELV induces a myelopathy. And Dr. Shropshire says, I think it seemed to be related to the neuropathy aspect. Does anyone else have any comments on this or any of the other causes that were not seen in the paper? Okay, I'm going to go ahead then. So uh, the limitations that the authors mentioned was that there was no standardized sampling protocol, um, which is fair because it was a retrospective study. Uh, they were relying on the owner observation of uh, signs of incontinence, which uh, Dr. Lilich and Dr. Long touched on previously. Uh, there were too few consistent treatment types, which is uh, difficulty with many retrospective studies and uh, multi-center studies would be needed to generate the numbers necessary for um, getting more information uh, from that data. So in conclusion, um, this study says that spinal cord disorders were most common in the study at least, and there was a poor outcome. Bladder and urethral disease had a better outcome. Uh, efficacy of treatment cannot be assessed, and larger scale controlled studies are needed. As far as whether this changes the way I practice, um, the prior cases I've seen have mainly been related to FIC, spinal trauma, uh, GUD, and post PU related incontinence. Um, I sort of wonder about the prevalence of spinal related urinary incontinence and whether I'm missing those cases because they're all over with neuro. Um, and then I was asking about sort of what treatment options we have that have actually worked for people other than uh, treatment for FIC, antibiotics for urinary tract infections, um, and PPA. And actually, I'm covering that on the next slide. Um, but I was wondering if anyone else had comments on whether this paper changes the way that they practice.
thing that I was uh, that I took from it was when they were discussing the neurologic causes. Um, you know, I often thought that for cats and dogs to be showing symptoms of incontinence associated with a neurologic injury, they should be showing other evidence of that as well too. And uh, unless I unless I read it wrong, it seemed like there were um, cases that certainly had the incontinence be maybe the one of the main features without having everything like the full cauda equina syndrome and other things that were present. So um, that was something that I thought was an interesting finding because I, I usually am looking for gait abnormalities, loss of tail tone, anal tone, things like that to feel more confident, but maybe I need to keep that on the list maybe a little bit more than I had previously. Does anybody else have any other comments um, other than uh, Dr. Quimby, who is waxing eloquent about neuro exam in, in cats? Okay. So, um, from the ASVNU, I asked what uh, treatments have actually worked uh, for people treating incontinence in cats. Um, there was a little bit of uh, sadness as far as nothing working or no particular pattern of treatment. Um, manual expression, I also would hazard to say I wouldn't define as a treatment for urinary incontinence, uh, although certainly it relieves the problem of um, voiding related um, problems. Uh, PPA only worked for two of the respondents. Um, Prazosin was mentioned, Deslorelin was mentioned, and I didn't know if that was from the person who wrote the uh, Deslorelin implant paper, uh, Nicurgoline and Cisapride. Uh, hydraulic occluder was mentioned by one person as working, um, which is interesting given what we'll see in, in a subsequent slide. Uh, ballooning worked for uh, one stricture, and then another case had reimplantation with laser ablation stent and medications for an ectopic ureter. Um, since this was a relatively limited number of people from the total number of folks that are attending today, um, do any of you have comments beyond um, these treatments that are mentioned for things that have worked for feline incontinence? I will say we saw a few of these while I was at MSU and we tried to try different treatments because we knew they would be eventually part of the study. Um, and we had really no improvement in, in anything that we tried, but I have had a couple now that I've been out in practice that I've tried on Proin that maybe have gotten a little bit better. Um, and I think it kind of speaks back to, you know, obviously, what the underlying cause of the incontinence is, um, and sometimes finding that is hard, but. Dr. Byron mentions that um, uh, she has one patient on oxybutynin uh, that now is improved. Dr. Ross says, I had one that had a distal urethral stricture presented as incontinence. The stricture was corrected and the cat was corrected as well. Does anyone else have any other comments? And then Dr. Locke comments that there were a few in this study and uh, those had the best outcomes, so the stricture related one. Uh, Dr. Kendall says we also had a urethral stricture case recently that improved after ballooning. Dr. Ross says for real incontinence, I've had a, some respond to PPA, a few to oxybutynin, and the rest have been hair pullers. Right. 
Dr. Ross says, I pulled my hair. They were not pulling theirs, which I assume to be the case. Does anybody else have any comments? Dr. Long asks, how did the hydraulic occluder go? All right, so um, one more slide uh, here. So uh, for future work, um, I guess one question is how visible is this problem? Um, do most owners identify inappropriate elimination or are they actually identifying incontinence? Um, could we be doing more to study incontinence in general? And then what uh, feline interventional applications are there out there like hydraulic occlusion? Um, and on the side here, Dr. Byron says, we had two occluders and one did well, the other did not do well. Uh, Dr. Vincent says, we have a, had a hydraulic occluder cat in the last year that ended up necrosing its urethra and it turned into a nightmare. So that doesn't sound good. Um, so your responses for uh, interventional procedures were that there were two hydraulic occluders, two balloon dilations, two urethral stents, a neo-ureterosystotomy, and collagen bulking. Uh, and then I, I think we've been talking about uh, what worked as far as hydraulic occluders are concerned and balloon dilation. Um, does anybody have any comments on collagen bulking in cats? Uh, Dr. Clarou just mentioned that um, there was one cat with a hydraulic occluder that's doing well. Dr. Adams says our storage scope only has a three French working channel, so can't do collagen injection which makes sense. I did kind of wonder how the collagen bulking was achieved. Um, if one of you folks is the person who did that collagen bulking procedure, I'd be very interested. And Dr. Clarou says, I've not performed collagen injections, but have considered PCCL. And is that approach an option? That's really interesting, actually. Does anybody have any comments on that? And then Dr. Byron says, yeah, that would be the approach. That makes a lot of sense. Dr. Clarou says, my main concern is the short-term duration in dogs. So I haven't been pushing to do it in cats. Does anybody else have any comments as sort of wrap-up comments? Dr. Byron was saying that um, she's never done it in a cat. And Dr. Adams was agreeing that repeated PCCL would be problematic. I'll give people another second to uh, to comment since this is my last slide. And just say in general, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, JD, if you're still here, do we have anybody signed up in two weeks? Um, I don't believe we do yet, which is a great opportunity for the uh, 60 people that are on rounds right now. If you'd like to participate and present at the next session. Uh, we're looking for someone that's in an opening we have in the schedule. So either email me or sign up with the link that I uh, have sent to you probably way more times than you would have liked to received it. Um, but we do have round scheduled again, same time in two weeks time. And I will send out the details once we've confirmed the presenter. Uh, and hopefully we'll get that locked down in the next uh, few days for sure. And I just wanted to thank everyone for responding to the survey that I sent out. Um, I, I do think it was really helpful to see what other people's experiences were in the course of talking about everything. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. And unless anybody has any other comments. Can I just, um, can I make a quick plug to remind people to accept the 
the invitations to review manuscripts whenever they can, because without getting um, reviewers, it's really hard to get manuscripts like this out in press. Absolutely. And thanks for the uh, authors of this paper who were able to attend. Really appreciate it. Discussion today was great. Um, Ewan, thanks so much for stepping up and doing the presentation. It was wonderful. I uh, really hope to have ongoing conversations like this and in the future. So thanks everybody for coming and look forward to meeting again in two weeks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Thanks, Ewan. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Uh, what is this there? Uh, what is this?